All right, good morning, everyone. We, um, we need to brighten the mood in here a little bit this morning. Um, and, and that's exactly what God has given me to do here. Because um, when I was thinking about preaching in between uh, Christmas and New Year, um, it's one of those Sundays that's always a little different, you know. Uh, it, it's, it's an in-between Sunday. It's the time in between. And so, um, you know, historically it's one of the most, the, the least attended services of the year. Uh, it, it's, it's one where it's not quite sure what to do. You know, you just came down off the high of Christmas and getting ready to go on the high of, of New Year's. Uh, it, it's, it's kind of... It's kind of that in-between time. And so I decided to talk about the in-between. The in-between time. What do you do <clears throat> in the in-between? What do you do uh, when you're between uh, the end of one thing and the beginning of something new? What do you do when you're, when you're, at, the end of, uh, when you're at the end of something that you held dear or that it was important to you or that, that mattered a lot and then all of a sudden that thing is gone and, and, you're, and you're waiting for the next thing. For some it might be a relationship, maybe th there was an end to a relationship that, that was very important to you, that mattered a lot to you and all of a sudden that relationship is gone and now you're, you're waiting, not sure exactly when the next one will be there, but you're in that in-between time. What do you do in the in-between time? When you're in a season of life that, that you're not quite sure about, when, when you, um, well, how many of you all know I just became a grandfather? I think, I think most of you know that, right? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Cody and Megan's baby was born on Christmas Eve. Uh, she's a beautiful little, little girl. She's not all that little. I mean, <laughs> relatively speaking, you know. Uh, she was nine pounds and 14 ounces or something like that. Yeah. Almost 10 pounds. Yeah. She's, she's a good, sturdy girl. Um, so, yeah, but, but, you know, there's an in-between even there, in-between being parents and being grandparents, you know, and all the grandparents have told me, this is a good, you know, this is a good thing. So, uh, it, it, you know, we're, I'm looking forward to that, but, you know, th there's that in-between when, when, when your kids are, are going from maybe high school to college or, or moving out, you know, and, and, and you're in that place, that season of life where you're, you're not quite sure what to do with yourself. What do you do in those in-between times? Whatever it, whatever it may be. Well, I think one of, one of my favorite stories in the, in the Bible is about a man who found himself in the in-between time. And, and God spoke to him very clearly and, and as I was preparing for this, uh, I, I felt like God was just directing me to this story uh, in, in a very clear way and saying, this is, this is where you are right now. This is where we are as a church right now. That, that we are in this in-between time, in between what God was doing and what God is about to do. Do you hear what I'm saying? And then as I started to think about that, I started thinking, man, there are so many of these in the Bible. <laughs> there are so many of these moments in, in biblical history where God brings his people to that place. And then he says, okay, stop right here because right here is the in-between. Right here is where what you've been doing is, going, is different from what you are going to be doing. You're in the between. What you were doing is ending. What you are going to do is, is beginning. But you're right here right now. You're, you're in the middle. You're in the in between. And it's, and it's there that we have to make some choices. We have to make some clear, hard choices in that moment. And 
And that's where I believe God has brought us to. That he has brought us to this place of being in between. That he, that he is, and, and as I look back over the last few months, it, it's very clear to me. Even, I was, I was talking this over with Sam because he's, he's preaching in Lancaster, the, the same message. And, and he, said, he said, you know, it, it, it's, as I look back over what God has done. Or what, and, and what he's led us to preach and, and, and be about over the last few months. It's been a progression of leading us to this moment. It, it, it really, I mean, it probably starts further back, but I'm only going to go back as far as the Kazone series. When we went through the Kazone series and we, and, and we looked at what am I really here for? Like, what is my purpose? What is my passion? What am I here to do? Right? And, 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 we, and we looked at that, and, and many, many of you took that very seriously and, and looked hard at it. And, and, and here's what I, what I believe. Don't forget about that. It's easy to just forget about it because it's going, it's done, it's over, we're moving on. You know, don't forget about it because that was part of the preparation for where we are going. Go back and review that. Go back and look again at what God has done for you. At, at what God has given to you, how he's gifted you, how he's called you, how he's wired you, how, you, how he's experienced you in, in a way to prepare you for what is coming. Then we went into Nehemiah. <laughs> Whew, I don't know if I'll ever preach through Nehemiah again. I, and it's funny because I've gone back and like looked at like other churches and other preachers who have gone through, who have preached through the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah just seems to perk up the devil's ears. I'm not sure what, is, what it is about it. Uh, I think I do know now about what it is because Nehemiah is simply nothing but spiritual warfare. And when you're training, uh, when you're training an army for warfare, the enemy, your enemy gets agitated, gets nervous, Right? I mean, look at CNN or look at, you know, Fox News or any of them. They, they put on there, oh, uh, I, I just saw a news report yesterday. I didn't even watch what it was, but they showed a couple of rockets and they said, uh, Iran is uh, preparing a new, a new way for warfare or something like that. Why do we care? Why do we put that on, on the screen, on the news, with all the other things we could be reporting on? Why do they report that? Because... They are perceived as our enemy, and when your enemy starts to prepare their weapons, starts to prepare for war, for battle, you pay attention to that, right? And it, and it works the other way around. When, when, when the church begins to prepare for battle, begins to prepare for spiritual warfare, uh, our spiritual enemy perks up his ears and starts to pay attention. And that's exactly what the book of Nehemiah was all about. Then we moved into faith, hope, and love. Three things the enemy can't do anything with. He don't know what to do with those things. If, if you have, if you have a, a, a group of people who are prepared spiritually for battle and who are filled with faith, hope, and love, the enemy has no idea how to handle that. And now he's brought us to the in-between time. And here we are in the in-between. And here we are to make some choices. To make some decisions. And, and I believe God was very clear in telling me that Joshua 1.9 was the place to find these choices. Because Joshua himself had to make the same choices. Joshua... When he was a young man, he was one of the 12 spies that, that God sent into the promised land. And, and he went into the promised land and he saw what was there. He saw what God had promised. He saw the blessing of what it was. It was a land flowing with milk and honey. It was a, an amazing place. And he saw it with his eyes. He was enlightened to the, just the magnitude of what this promised land held for him and his people. And Joshua and Caleb saw it clearly. 
The other 10 that were with them just saw the problems. <laughs> they just saw the enemies. They, they just saw how big they were, how powerful they were, how mean they were. They, they said, we're like grasshoppers compared to these people. How are we going to be able to stand against them? We're so small and they're so big. We church, we could look around at the world that we live in and look at the problems and the issues and the things that are going on and we could say, look at how big the world is and how small we are. But we cannot take that view when we look to our God. That's what was the difference between Caleb and Joshua. When they looked at the promised land, they saw it as a promise from God. They saw it that God had promised them, this is going to be yours. This is what is yours. The other ten, they looked at it and said, look at all the problems. Look at all the enemies. Look at all the challenge. And so Joshua and Caleb had to wander around for 40 years because the others didn't see it. And so they, they, they went with Moses and they followed him and, and, they, and, and they served him. And Joshua was right there with Moses serving him this whole time. From a young man, he was serving Moses. He was doing things Moses' way. He was doing it the way Moses did it. How many of you know, when you're a Jew, if you do things the way Moses did it, you're pretty good, you're, you're going to be okay probably, right? In, in, that, in that time frame, it, Moses was the guy to look to. He was like, how do we do this? Ask Moses. He'll tell you. So they followed Moses. They served him. They honored him. They respected him. And then Moses died without going into the promised land. I'm not going to get into that, but he, he was prevented from going into the promised land. And this led to an in-between time. They were in between wandering in the desert and entering the promised land. And what do you do there? What do you do in that moment? And God spoke clearly to Joshua in this moment, and he gave him some clear guidance. And I want to show you what he said to him in Joshua 1, verse 1. He said, After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aide, Moses, my, ser my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I am about to give to them, to the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses." Listen, God made a promise to Moses that the Israelites would inherit this land. He waited out an entire generation. He waited out for an entire generation to die off because of their disobedience, because of their attitudes, because of their lack of faith. He waited them out for them to die off so that he could send a new generation into the promised land. Your territory, verse 4 says, your territory will extend from the desert of Lebanon to, uh, and from the great river Euphrates, all the, uh, all the Hittite country, to the Mediterranean Sea on the west. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give to them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the, left, to the right or to the left for you, uh, that you may be successful wherever you go. 
Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on, meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. That was the word that Joshua received from God. That was, what, that was Joshua's marching orders in the in-between time. He didn't know exactly what he was going to do, how he was going to do it, what it was going to look like. He didn't know any of those details. All he knew that was God was saying, prepare your heart and your mind for victory. Prepare your heart and mind for movement, for, for taking the promise that you have been given. And so I, I, I think there are some very clear principles in this that God wants us to pull out as a church and as a body and as a family uh, that, that is moving, for, uh, moving toward a promise that God has given to us. A promise that he's going to use us to build God's family together. That he is going to use us to reach York County and to reach uh, central Pennsylvania and to reach uh, the world in ways that we don't understand yet. We are right now reaching parts of the world that, that we never dreamed could, po could be possible. Through technology and through sent out missionaries, our message of building God's family together, of, of bringing people together to connect with God, connect with others, and connect in ministry is being, is being promoted all in, in, in places around the world that I, didn't even, that I can't even imagine. There are people that listen to the podcast and watch the video online. There are Dylan and Missy in, in, in Guatemala and Casey and Esther are on their way. We have things happening that we years ago we never thought possible. But I'm telling you now that God is being very clear with us in saying, this is, you're just scratching the surface. You have no idea. You have no idea. But listen, it, it requires a shift in attitude. It requires a shift in thought process. In me first, probably. I, I, have, to, I have to change my thinking about it. And then I think we collectively have to change our thinking about it. And, and where God is, how God is leading us. So how do we do that? Well, I, I think that, number one, in the in-between time, we have to choose whether we will look back or whether we will look forward. Church people, I am one of you. We are church people. Notor notoriously, church people love to look back. We just do. Right? We, we like to look back and say, oh, well, that's how my church did it when I was growing up. That's how we did it back into that place. That's how we used to do it. Those are the old things that we, and we grow to love those old things, and we love to grow, love those traditions, and, and love those ways, of, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. We, we celebrate those things, because those things meant something. How many of you know this, that all the old traditions at one time or another was something new and radical to the people that did it the first time? It was brand new. Listen, the, the first time that someone sang the old rugged cross in a church probably caused other people to leave. They were like, did you hear that newfangled music they're playing on it? The songs that Martin Luther wrote that we hold up in high esteem now as as. as you know, the, 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 the old hymns of the faith. They were written to the melody of bar songs because Martin Luther wanted to be relevant to the culture that he lived in and the people that he wanted to reach were in, were in pubs getting drunk and he thought, hey, if I can let them hear the music that they're hearing in the pub coming out of the church, maybe they'll come out of the pub and come into the church. Amen. <laughs> 
But now we've taken this legalistic viewpoint of, oh no, if it wasn't written before 1600, I don't want to sing it. Well, come on. Let's get some things in perspective. God has put us here for such a time as this. He's done it throughout history. He's done it throughout biblical history. It's a, con- it's a continuous changing, morphing, developing, growing thing. The church is not dead and stagnant, stuck in one place. It is a living, breathing, changing, developing organism that is put here to infect and infiltrate a world that is dying from sin. And when we lose sight of that, when we lose the mission and we trade the mission for methods, we have begun to die. Do do you hear what I'm saying? When you trade the mission for your method, you have created yourself an idol. Because we worship the methods. So in the in-between time, we have to choose whether we will look back or whether we will look forward. The Apostle Paul put it this way in Philippians. He says, not that I, in Philippians 3.12, not that I have already obtained all of this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to, to take hold of that for which Christ took hold of me. I press on. I press on forward, moving forward. Not that I've already obtained it. Not that we've already figured this whole church thing out. We haven't figured church out. We never will figure church out. Because church is a living, breathing organism that is constantly changing. It's just like my little granddaughter. Every day, for Three days now, she's been alive. All three days. All three days. When we've talked to Cody and Megan, they say, you know what? Yesterday she did this, but today she's doing that. Yesterday she wasn't doing this, but today now she's doing this. And I'm like, welcome to parenthood. Welcome to watching a baby grow. Because the thing that she did yesterday all day long, she'll never do again. Because she only needed to do it for that day. And we are that, church. We are a growing, developing baby. And toddler, and, and, and child, and teenager, adolescent. It, it's a, it's phase, you grow in phases. You grow in stages. There, there are things that work today that will not work ten years from now. Right? There are children right now, if you have a child that's four or five years old, if you keep trying to parent that child that's four or five years old the way you do today, 10 years from now when he's 14 and 15, it's not going to work. It's going to be embarrassing (laughs) for him and for you. (laughs) He says, Paul says in Philippians 3, 13, he, in 12, he said, I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind, I strain toward what is ahead. I strain toward what is ahead. The Apostle Paul was saying, I'm not stuck in the past. I'm not stuck in my old methods. If anyone could get stuck in his old methods, it would have been him. He was a Pharisee. His whole livelihood was based on methods. It was based on traditions. It was based on doing something a certain way because that's where his power came from. Listen, if your power is coming from doing something a certain way, an old way, that now there is a new way that God is calling you toward, but you're refusing it because you only know how to do it the old way and you're not willing to step out of that comfort zone and to press on into what is God is calling you to, you're stuck. You're stuck. Don't be stuck. We can't be stuck. 
Because we are a living, breathing organism that is moving, that is being guided and directed and called by God for which he took hold of us. We take hold of him and we press on and strain forward toward what he is calling us to. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. All of us then who are mature should take such a view of things. And if on some, if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. <laughs> I love that line. you got to stop and think about that sentence. Paul says, the Apostle Paul says, here's what I'm telling you. Uh, if on any of this point you think differently, sooner or later God will fix what you're thinking and you will see it clearly. I'll, I don't know, I like it. Only let us live up to what we have already attained, he says. Just let us live up to what we've already attained. Like some of us are so hungry for knowledge. We're so hungry to be filled with more and more and more and more. And God is saying, no, I I don't want to fill you up with more because you're not yet living up to attain what you've already got. Live a life that is worthy of what you already have and you will be given more. Right? (laughs) Right? We sometimes, we, we get so much, listen, I, I said it last week, I, I said it on Christmas Eve, as a matter of fact, if, if we could just learn to, to live, I forget which two words it was, but you can pick a lot of two words, with patience and love. Just go do that. That will keep you busy for the rest of your life, to just live perfectly in patience and love. You're going to need more help from from the Holy Spirit to live a life full of patience and love than you can ever imagine. Listen, I'm all about learning the Bible. I'm all about loving the Scripture and and, and, and learning as much as I can. I, I went to school for it. I teach it. I love it. But if I don't live it, then all of that learning is a waste of time. All it does is puff me up with pride and makes me useless. You've heard the old saying, he's so heavenly minded that he's no earthly good. Right? If you don't use what God has given to you, I'm telling you right now, if we, would, if, if we Christians would choose one verse in the Bible and just live it out, it would change the world. It would change the world. If you just took one passage, you take Galatians 5.22, love is patient and love is kind. Or, no, that's, that's 1 Corinthians 13. That's a good one too. Live that one out. <laughs> Galatians 5.22 is in the fruit of the Spirit are love, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. Just live that one. Listen, if you try to actually live that one out, you're going to end up calling on the name of Christ more than you ever thought possible because it, will, it is impossible to live that out without God's help. Without God's intervention, without the Holy Spirit's power in your life, you cannot live out 1 Corinthians 13. You cannot live out Galatians 5.22. Why? Because they are the fruit that is produced through the Holy Spirit that is in you. And if we could just learn to live those things out, I'm all about learning the whole Bible, learning the whole thing, every jot and tittle. I love it. I want it. I, I But if we don't live it, then it works against us. The in-between time, we have a choice to make whether we will walk by faith or whether we will walk by fear. In that moment where you're not quite sure what to do, there is, there is that tendency in us. We have a fight-flight response that is built into our instinct. And, and, it, and it makes us, it, it causes us to react when we are faced with fearful situations. 
What do I do in that moment? Well, the power of God in us is what empowers us and makes it possible for us to overcome that fear and to take a stance of faith and to say, I don't understand what's going on. I don't see, I I don't get it. But I do know that my God is in charge, that my God is sovereign, that my God is in control, that my God wants me to prosper and not to harm me, that he has a plan for me, that he wants me to be successful for him in what he has called me to do. And so therefore, I take a stance of faith, not fear. Fear causes me to want to run and hide. Or fear causes me to want to lash out. Fight or flight, (laughs) they're both fear responses. Faith is something totally different. Faith says, nope, God, you tell me what to do. You tell me how to respond. You give me a word that tells me what to do. And when God says, leave it alone, guess what I do? I got to leave it alone. Everybody around me say, oh, you need to call this person. You need to talk to that person. You need to go do this. You need to stand up for that. No, no. Nope, God told me to leave it alone. I got, I got to leave it alone. It's not easy for me to do. I'm not a leave it aloneer kind of guy. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm just not. It's not my DNA. It's not built into me to just leave things alone. But God says, walk by faith, not by fear. Leave it alone. And then one day God says, now take your stand. Because why? Because God sees a picture that I can't see. He sees something that is outside of the realm of where I am. And and he he can understand a, a, a bigger development that is going on. He has a plan. He has it in control. He has your life under control. He has your marriage under control. He has your children under control. If you will just cooperate with him by leaving it alone or taking your stand or stepping in or stepping back or saying this or not saying that, depending on what he tells you to do, it's all dependent on us communicating with our Savior. When we communicate with God, when we listen and obey his word, it changes everything. And that requires that we walk by faith, not by fear. Psalm 27.1 says, The Lord is my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life, of whom shall I be afraid? You see, it requires that we take our eyes off of the problem, that we take our eyes off of the enemy, that we take our eyes off of how big the giants are in the land, and we turn our eyes toward God. And we say, it's not about the problem, it's not about the giants, it's not about the enemy, it's not about the challenge or the situation, it's about God. And when I'll turn my eyes toward him, He becomes my deliverer. He becomes my salvation. Who do I need to fear when he is on my side? But we have to also be willing to obey his word. In the in-between times, we have to choose whether we will listen to and obey God's word or the world's word. Because there is word coming to you all the time. We have no shortage of advice in our world. Am I right? I mean, you can Google advice on anything. Anything. You name it, it's out there. Somebody is out there. There's a forum out there already waiting for you to tell you how to feed turtles. Or I guess that's not all that strange. But, you know, there's probably a lot stranger Anything that you can think of that you want to do, I guarantee you someone has already thought about it, written about it, it's on the internet, you can find it. We have no shortage of advice. But we don't need advice from the world. We need our marching orders from God. We need our marching orders from our commander, the the one who we are following. 
It, the, 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 Jesus used that example one time. He says, he says a soldier doesn't look to the world to find what he's, he looks to his commander. He obeys what his command tells him to do. And so we have to be willing to look to Look to God, not be, not be caught up in the, in, the, in the affairs of the world, but to stay focused on our mission. To stay focused on what it is that God is doing in your life. What is God doing in your marriage? What is God doing in your job? What is, listen, God is intimately involved in everything that you do. And if you will involve him in everything that you do, you will be able to come into into alignment with that. It's just like, it's just like tuning an instrument. When, 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 I'm, when I'm tuning an instrument and, and, there's, and, and I'm out of tune, I have two strings that are not in tune with each other, it sounds terrible. They're, they're, they're not working together. But when I tune one of them to match the other one, then all of a sudden, they just work. They just work. We need tuned to what God is doing. This is what prayer does for us. This is what crying out to God does to us. Asking God, God, what do you want? In all my ways, I acknowledge him and he will make my path straight. That means I come into alignment with his will. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's a, it's a tuning of my will to his will. And it changes everything. So will we obey his word? Will we listen and obey his word? Not only the Bible, but especially the Bible. But also just God's word to us. When he speaks to us in our hearts. Have you learned to listen to his voice? To recognize his voice in your life? Second Peter 1 says in verse 19, We also have a prophetic message have the prophetic message as something complete, uh, completely reliable, and you will do well to pay attention to it as to a light shining in the dark place until the day dawns and the morning stars rise in your hearts. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture comes about by the prophet's own interpre uh, interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. When we look at Scripture, you need to understand that this Scripture was spoken through humans that were called to be prophets, that were called to say the words of God, to write down the words of God, and this prophecy that we've been given, this proclaiming of God's Word in our lives through the Scripture and through Him speaking to us is what, is what He uses to guide us on the path that He has set for us. And it's on that path that we get to come in tune with him, that we get to experience all that he has for us so that we can live out what he told Joshua. In the in-between time, we have a choice whether we will be strong and courageous or weak and discouraged. The word courageous there is important because how many of you know that courage is a choice? This, this is hard for some of us, I, 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 me included. Like when I am, when I am afraid, it, I don't think that I felt, I, I don't feel like at that moment that I chose to be afraid. I'm just afraid, right? It, it's, a, it's a response. It's, it's, a, it's an instinct that comes out of me. And, it, and when those natural instincts come out of me, I have to make a choice at that moment. Will I surrender to that natural instinct and just go with it? Or will I call upon a supernatural power that is within me called the Holy Spirit that can override the natural instinct? Supernatural always overrides natural. Do you know that? That's why faith can override fear. That's why courage can override discouragement. I could choose to just be discouraged. I have plenty to be discouraged about right now. I have plenty to just go navel-gazing. You know what that is? That's when you just go look at your belly button 
all day long and just sit there, oh, poor me, wah, wah, wah. Poor me, all these problems, boo, hoo, hoo. Or I could just read the word of God where he says, be strong and courageous. Listen, if it weren't possible, he wouldn't tell us to do it. God will never, he will never tempt you and he will never taunt you by telling you to do something that he hasn't already made it possible for you to accomplish, for you to do. So when God says be strong and courageous, guess what? You, get, you can be strong and courageous. You don't have to be discouraged. You don't have to be weak. You don't have to be beaten down. It's not an arrogant thing. It's a dependent thing. I am dependent on the Holy Spirit to come and live in and through me so that I can experience the courage that comes through knowing that my God is in charge. So I don't have to succumb to that. I don't have to give in to that. I don't have to lay down and just take Joshua 1.7 says, Be strong and courageous. Be careful to obey the law that my servant Moses gave you. Don't turn from the right to the left. Keep this book of the law on your lips. Meditate on it day and night. Listen to my word. Hear what I'm saying to you so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. How do we be prosperous and successful? We listen to God's word. We listen to what he tells us. We obey his commands. We don't just be hearers of the word, but we doers also. And it's in that that God has created a very simple formula for us to be prosperous and successful as a body, as families, as individuals, as a church, as anything that you're involved in, if you will just simply acknowledge him in all your ways. He makes the path straight. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that we can that we can come before you and know that you hear our prayers. That your grace is beyond anything that we can even fathom. That you are bigger, that you are greater, that you are more powerful than any problem We're in an enemy that comes against us. And it's in that, Lord, that some of us in this room right now are just up against that place. We're in that in-between time where it seems like something that that, that we were very comfortable with, that we were very uh, satisfied with, has just come to an end. And there's something new on the horizon. And so, Lord, we pray that in this transition moment in our lives and all the transitions that will come as we live out our lives for you, that we would be willing to be strong and courageous, to listen for your word, to live by faith and not by fear, and to be guided by your voice and not the world's. So, Lord, as we, as we give this time to you right now and just celebrate your grace, and just celebrate what you've done for us, we ask, Lord, that, that you would do a new thing in our hearts, that you would empower us and encourage us and lift us up to new heights. You would prepare us, our hearts and our minds, that we would be ready to to move into the promised land that you've put before us. Whatever that is and whatever it looks like, Lord, uh, it doesn't matter. What matters is that you go before us and we follow you. So we thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together.